Hi, everybody. Um, am I too loud or am I okay? All right. I'm Terry Danziger. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to my didactic today. Um, if you're able to get into school everywhere. Um, I'm a, uh, the Division Chair of Pediatric Emergency Medicine in Albany, um, at Albany Medical Center. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about the de-escalation of parents. Um, I have no disclosure to share today. This is not a research-based talk. You probably got that much from reading the title, even though SAM is very research-focused. This is a talk um, where I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to give you some tips and tricks. And um, hopefully, you're going to walk away with a new perspective on how to deal with your pediatric patients, your pediatric patients' parents, and maybe even the parents of some of your adult patients as well. Why? <laughs> so when I was 19, um, I could date myself, but over 20 years ago, I worked at Starbucks. And they teach you in all of your Starbucks lessons about customer service and quality and atmosphere. And I'm not trying to tell you that this is about all about customer service. But what this is about is them teaching you that if someone comes back and says, my drink wasn't hot enough or you didn't get my double, triple cappuccino right, you don't fight with them about it. You don't argue with them about it. You put it aside and you make a new one. Because ultimately, that's the easiest solution to give them the quality product that we were trying to make. And what we're trying to do is give quality patient care, and that means quality all the way through. Not just the care we're giving, but also that connection we're having people, that communication we're having with people. If we escalate, if they escalate, we're removing from that quality, we're removing from that satisfaction. And so that's where it comes from. I have worked at six different hospitals at this point in my career. Um, I, I also have a very anxious mother. Um, I also have children, so all of those experiences over the past 20 years have kind of helped me hone into this, how I feel that I am somewhat expert on this talk, with still a lot more to learn because I learn on every single shift. And now we're going to hope that this works, if you can pull up um, from the barcode here, and then we'll get into our little bit of our survey. What comes to mind when you think about patients in the ER? Let me your words. Let me know your feelings. Anybody else feel annoyed? Sometimes annoyed. <laughs> Disruptive. Absolutely difficult. Worried. They are worried, right? We're worried. They're also worried. We feel stressed. We feel anxious. They feel stressed. They feel anxious. All of these are things that they're feeling and you're feeling. How frequently are you yelled, screamed, sworn at by a patient or a parent? Daily, often, sometimes, or never. That's a lot. I know, I mean, in, my, in our adult ED, you guys get yelled at five times a day. This is not easy. I've lost my temper and yelled back. I applaud you, 76%. And for the other 25%, I hope that I can help you with this talk. And for the 75%, 80% who haven't done it but have been on the verge, I'm going to prevent you from crossing over. Okay? Child first. So that's not, that's a logo from some hospital somewhere. Um, but our goal is the best care of the child, and that is what the parent wants too. And that's the core of all of this, is that as much as they feel like a barrier and as much as they feel difficult, they are just there because they are worried about their child. And whether it's their child with a cut on their finger um, that they want plastics for, or it's the actual multi-trauma critical patient, it is still their child who they are at their core worried about. And that is sometimes what ends up being the bigger barrier for us as providers because we are mostly worried about that critical patient and we're thinking, oh, you don't have to worry about this, it's nothing. To them, it's not nothing. To them, it's still bringing their child into an emergency room and seeking care. So let's just get back to the basics. Why do these things escalate? 
parents start out with all of these things against them. They went to their pediatrician first. They went to an urgent care first. They waited for four hours at urgent care just to be told to come to us. They went to another hospital, waited three hours, and then got sent to us. They're told that orthopedics will be waiting for them. Or maybe they're not told that, but that's what they think they were told. They stop at McDonald's on the way over, so then they can't be sedated for four more hours. So there's all these things stacked against them. They don't trust us. And that has just been growing and growing and growing. Um, they have kind of unexpected, unrealistic expectations based on their own beliefs or based on what somebody told them. Um, they come at 11 a.m. and they're still there at three and they have to pick up their children. So there's all these factors that are just building as they're sitting there that are not necessarily in our control, but we need to be aware of them. Because even if they've only been in our department for 30 minutes, they might be already on hour nine in their day. And they haven't eaten and they haven't slept. And sometimes it's like four in the morning. And what are our barriers? So we are, we have time constraints, we are busy. There is a waiting room. There's 30 other children or 50 other adults to see. Um, we don't have enough nurses or staff. We're tired. Um, and um, we avoid. So like we know that a parent is angry and we go the other way. Um, and we get results back on something, but they're not all back. And so we don't go in until everything's back. Well, then they're waiting for an extra hour when we could have put them at mine and said, everything so far is looking good. But we still have one more test we're waiting for. So we kind of aggravate the problem. We also have a lot of other patients who are really, really sick. And so we can't focus our time on every single patient. So our initial, this is just the core of what we can all do better every single day. And it's hard because it takes that extra five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, 10 minutes for every patient. If they are allowed to eat, offer them food. Or make an effort to tell your team who's allowed to eat. Because there's nothing worse than like a six-year-old who's hungry. Um, or a parent who has, a pregnant parent who hasn't eaten in 14 hours. So offer them food if they can have food. If you are doing a workup for appendicitis and you know that you're gonna get labs and you're gonna get an ultrasound and it's gonna take four hours, tell them ahead of time. You got sent in for abdominal pain. This is how long this process is gonna take us so that you're not expecting to be out two hours from then. Um, checking in. So when you take sign out on a patient, make it a habit to go in and check in and introduce yourself. So that when two hours later the ultrasound is negative and the labs are back and you're reassessing their belly pain, you're not abruptly coming in and overwhelming that family with a new face um, when they haven't seen anyone in three or four hours. Have you, any of you been a patient in an ER where you have just waited for hours for someone to come in and tell you that what's happening next? They feel forgotten about constantly. And even if you don't have any results back, but you pop your head in for 30 seconds and say, I haven't forgotten about you, I'm waiting for those labs to come back. You're not blaming anyone, you're not blaming radiology that they're way backed up. You're just saying, just waiting for radiology to give us a final read on that x-ray. I looked at a preliminary and I'm not seeing anything concerning, but that's why you're still here. That is everything. And that is those are the simple things we can do every day that we forget because we are running around and we are too busy asking if they have questions, treating their pain, all the things that we can do ahead of it to prevent the frustration. Woo, okay. A lot of judgment, a lot of threatening, a lot of telling them, no, you can't leave and I'm not gonna let you. How successful is she gonna be at convincing them to stay? Zero. Um, and judgment is one of the hardest things that we have to overcome. Um, in this particular situation, these are parents who don't want antibiotics and they don't use vaccines. And there was a previous scene where that came out in her discussion with them and she absolutely showed judgment. And that, just setting that up with the parent where they feel like they're being judged by us, loses that trust right off the bat. Um, this, can, this degree of escalation where she loses her temper and gets mad and has judgment can happen not just with parents, but with consultants, with other colleagues, um, with the patient themselves if they're an adult. Um, so it's obviously not ideal. Why does it happen? So you guys get abused all day, every day. So you're angry um, and you're burnt out, you're tired. 
Um, you are doing a long shift. You don't have enough staffing. You are it's overcrowded, um, and we are losing our empathy. Um, and I've heard people say, "Why are they even here? Their kid is fine." How do you think a parent feels when they hear you saying that at the desk, when they can hear right in that room? Um, or if you actually say to the parent, there's other kids sicker than your kid. That is not something that, as a parent, you ever want someone to tell you, even if it's true, right? Someone died in the next room. And you'd love for that parent to get it and say, no, 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 you're dealing with something much more sick. And I'd say, like, you know, 1% of the parents will see that and get that. And the other, still are just worried about their kid. We can't fault them for that, and we can't make them feel guilty about that, and we can't judge them for that. Um, there is definitely bias that goes on in the rooms we avoid because we start out aggressive and you know they're aggressive and so then you don't go there. And then we actually make the problem worse by not communicating with them. Um, there's families who we absolutely treat differently even if we're not intending to because there's an odor coming from the room or because they're more unkempt. Um, and those are the things that are implicit. Those are the things that we're, we are not intentionally doing, but we do them. And parents can sense them. Um, I had a mother who was like, you're annoyed with me, aren't you? Wow, you read me really well. Because I was annoyed with her. And I was not doing a very good job of hiding that. Um, and so we, it's, it's very impactful how we are feeling. And it's very impactful these engagements we have with families and parents based on our own experiences. And so what I'm asking you today is to take a step back, take a deep breath, know that our jobs are hard and you're tired and you're overwhelmed and it's really hard to have empathy for the parent who is losing their mind about a cut on the chin. Um, but reframe it and bring yourself back to understanding that for this parent, for this child, this might be their worst day that they've had so far. And it's very overwhelming. And maybe that parent, the last time they were in the hospital, their parent died. And it's really traumatic for them. So finding that empathy again and taking a step back and thinking, how can we make this right? How can we bring our kindness? How can we just be nice? Um, and how can we help them figure out the barriers, figure out the communication, and avoid the cops? To see myself when I see a plate in situations, I'm like, I am helping. Um, and when I walk away from those circumstances where I was able to talk that patient down off that ledge or that parent down off that ledge and convince them to stay, convince them to do the treatment course that we want to do, or come up with some sort of compromise, I walk away feeling really, really good because I did what was the best thing for that child and I was able to work it out with that parent to find that compromise. And all of these things are what that administrator did in that situation. She was calm, she made eye contact. She, I think at some point she actually did a touch, which may or may not be appropriate. You have to kind of read, read the room and read the situation. She apologized, um, which sometimes is one of the biggest things that you can do in that room. Not apologizing because you did something wrong, but just apologize for the misunderstanding, apologize for the frustration, apologize for the poor communication. <clears throat> listening, really listening. Why are they angry? Is it because of the antibiotics? Is it because of the time? Is it because they need to go pick up their other kid? What is really the barrier that is re causing them to reach that level of escalation? And how can we help it? Um, the empathy, the non-judgment. Um, certainly, you know, people are going to make choices about not doing vaccines. It's not our job to, you know, change their mind in the emergency department. Um, acknowledge wants and feelings and taking responsibility and that falls into the apology realm. Um, I am so sorry that I haven't been back in this room for three hours. Now you're not going to say there was a sicker kid and your kid wasn't as important but you can give them a sense you know we are, we're a very acute department right now I'm really sorry that I haven't been able to check on you. Is there anything you need while we're waiting for XYZ? And those are kind of the language that you can use. Avoiding threats and finding those limits. So the minute you say, you can't leave, I'm not going to let you, they're booking it. Um, and I will say that I can count on one hand the times I've ever really gotten to that point of telling them, you can't leave. Because we're going to do everything in our power to get to that point of compromise and figuring it out before we even talk about what they can and can't do. Because generally, even though it seems like an impossible mountain to climb, we can always find a compromise. Um, and try to work it out. Um, 
choose wisely what you insist on. So you have a baby who's 45 days old and they have a fever and you're worried about meningitis and our protocol tells us to get an LP and the parent is not consenting to the LP. We can't insist on the LP, we can't force the LP, but we can still do the treatment for meningitis, we can still give antibiotics, we can still admit the patient for observation. So there was a really interesting article about um, these decisions about a doctor insisting on a urine cat in an under 60 day baby because that's the best way to get the urine. And that was the line in the sand that they were drawing. That's not a line in the sand that I'm gonna draw. I'd rather get a calf urine. I don't really want a bad urine, but I'll take it if that's all you're gonna give me. And I'm not gonna kind of take the risk of you leaving without treatment based on that. I made this slide because a lot of parents are crazy. And there's crazy because they think they deserve special treatment. And then there's crazy because they think they're getting mistreated. And there's all sorts of like crazy in the middle and a really small portion of people that are normal. And you kind of have to read the room. You can't take the same approach with everybody. So there are some parents who want all the details and want every single thing down to the, down to the fine you know, nitty gritty of it. And then there are parents who don't want any of the information but just want to be told I need to get admitted or I need to go home. Um, you have to figure out who's escalated and why they're escalated and what's going to be your best approach with them. Um, and then you need to know, um, know your allies, know your data. So if we're going to talk about a head CT and who needs one and who doesn't, referring to PCARN or referring to any of the guidelines sometimes will help the parent understand why we really don't think your child needs that head CT. Now, are you really going to always go to bat every single time about doing it or not doing it? Maybe not. Um, but if that's your tipping point, there's a lot of places where you can reach from to help support what you're trying to say. What happens when you can't? Have you failed? What happens when you fail at de-escalation and the parent is still there and they're starting to threaten you and you're starting to feel scared? I call it the tap out. You remove yourself. You have other colleagues who might be over somewhere else in the ED that you can ask for their help. There's usually a medical director. There's usually an administrator on call. Um, you find those other people who can help you in that situation. Generally, you have a risk department. Generally, you have a legal department. You find out what the rules are in your institution before you take your first shift. What are the AMA rules? Are these parents allowed to leave? Am I supposed to sign them out AMA? Am I supposed to call CPS every time? That's a whole nother lecture that I give. That is a whole nother hour talk. Um, but you're, you don't, you're not in there by yourself. You're not the end all be all. And especially at a resident level, if there are residents or fellows in the room, when you're reaching this point with a parent, get your attending in there sooner rather than later. Don't let it escalate to the point that that attending then cannot walk it back and try to figure out what to do next. And on my last slide, when it gets to that point that the parent is like, I'm out of here, then you have to really do your risk assessment. Who can leave and who can't leave? And again, a whole other lecture topic. But who is at imminent danger and who is not at imminent danger? And what compromise can you make? Can you do a dose of IV antibiotics and send them home with oral? Can you send them home doing asthma treatment more frequently than you normally would at home? Can you bring them back in 12 hours for a check or another dose? There's a lot of things you can do, and that doesn't mean that they're leaving AMA. You can come up with a non-ideal discharge plan, but it can still be a discharge plan, and you can still write for antibiotics, you can still give asthma treatments, you can still give them all the same care, even if they don't totally agree on the final um, path of admission or non-admission. So don't forget that there's still a lot that you can do for that child, even if you and the parent aren't totally seeing eye to eye. And don't forget that the ultimate goal is doing right by that child. If ultimately you can't come to an agreement, you are gonna involve your risk and your legal and your CPS and, and your security. Um, but I'll tell you, in 20 years, I've only really had to do that one time. Um, which means that it should be something that we do very, very frequently. Um, and I hope that um, this talk today has helped you to get some of those tools. It's brief. I could talk about this for much longer, as I've already gone over time. Um, but just reminding you to, that kindness, um, empathy, communication is at the core of everything we do for patient care and quality care um, and doing our best care for that child. Um, so thank you so much all for being here and coming to my talk and um, reach out with any questions and I can open for questions here if you have any.
very, very, I, I mean, I'm a micromanager, you know this. I mean, you were one of my residents. Um, you can kind of read the room. My nurses actually will say like, that's not going well, like with a resident and I can step in and having that relationship with the nurses is super helpful because they can let me know when a parent is already heightened and escalated and then you kind of know to keep an eye on it and you know to warn the resident, hey, don't tell that parent X, Y, Z until you have talked to me. And I, it's one of the things I teach the interns on their very first day um, when I give them their lecture. Don't tell a family that they're gonna get a head CT if that's not something that you know I told you we're okay with. Because the hardest thing for me is to backtrack on something that you've promised that we don't intend to do. So don't make promises that are kind of out of your realm. Um, and if a, if a resident gets fired by a family more than once, then that's time for the resident to get some feedback about how their communication interaction skills are going. Recently, I had it happen to a resident twice on one shift, so we had a chat. <laughs> Thank you all so much.